Well, this morning, I, or not this morning, but earlier this week, I saw a homemade yard sign that was rather unusual, had just four words on it. It said, end the Washington cartel. Kind of like, well, what's, what does that mean? A cartel is a group of businesses that conspire together to fix prices in a certain market. And it's like, when we think of a cartel, we often think of the drug cartels. And indeed, those drug cartels are very powerful and very evil. And I think Washington, D.C. appears now to have more in common with criminal drug cartels than with a civil government devoted to the God-ordained purpose of defending and protecting the God-given rights of the citizens in that land. What has happened to America, I believe, is that we have become an idolatrous nation. Now, we don't see it on the blatant surface because we don't have a bunch of temples with idols that people are bowing down to and sacrificing chickens to or what have you, but we do see it in the attitudes of the American people. They have replaced in their minds the one true God with the worthless beast that is Washington, D.C. This idol provides or promises to provide for them cradle to grave provide their education, their food, their housing, their transportation, their retirement, their health care, and on and on and on the list of promises go. And we have a people, as a people, have been sold a lie because no human institution, even a God-ordained institution, can possibly do all that they have promised they will do. And human civil government, by the way, was never ordained or never authorized by God to do most of the things that are on that list of promises in the first place. But perhaps the facade is beginning to crack of this idol in this presidential election. I think this election cycle has revealed a kind of ugly side of the beast consider this, and you might not agree with my opinion, and that's fine, but we have over 300 million people in this land, and these two candidates are what we can come up with, the best our nation has to offer? I don't know about you, but I think there's something wrong with that picture, because the character of both of what I would call the big box candidates has been shown to be morally deficient in an enormous way, on a grandiose scale, they've demonstrated their corruption and their untrustworthiness, whether it's lying about Benghazi, lying about illegal criminal email servers, lying about attacking women who were raped by her husband, on the one hand, or on the other side, wealth built on a corrupt business of casinos and strip clubs and eminent domain that is stealing people's property for your own profit not to mention serial adultery and uh, accusations now of rape as well. These have to be some of the lowest lowlifes that have ever run for president of these United States. And these two still have many people supporting them and looking to them. And the reason appears to me is that they are peddling promises, promises to give them things. For many, it's the promises of government handouts that keep their support for their favored candidate. They're looking to the idol to provide for them cradle to grave, to do for them that which God never ordained human civil government to do at all. Others are expecting that the problems of the world will somehow be solved if the right candidate takes the office of the White House that world poverty will come to an end, that hunger and disease and people who have the wrong attitudes towards other people or people who say things that are not politically correct. Uh, and, of course, uh, global warming will come to an end. We know that that's all a big lie anyway. No human being can solve these problems. No human being is able to deal with just one of them. Let's take world poverty. We know that because Jesus said in his ministry here on earth, for ye have the poor with you always. You're never going to end poverty because it's a problem of the human heart. And in this world, that will not be a problem solved. So anybody prom promising to solve world poverty, you know they're a liar and they are in violation of what Jesus has clearly said. No human being, no human institution will ever completely deal with that problem. And so people have an unrealistic, indeed I would say, an idolatrous worship of politicians, believing these politicians can solve intractable problems in this world. 
They have a messianic hope that their candidate, if their candidate but obtains the Oval Office, that then because of these human beings, somehow their powers are unlimited and their abilities are unmatched by anyone else in the world, that they will solve all of these problems and bring perfect peace and stability and prosperity that the voters are longing for. Well, this is nothing short of idolatry, worshiping man instead of God. And sound thinking recognizes that people who have moral failures in their own life, in their own families, as the big box candidates demonstrate, that those failures in their own life and their own family will certainly translate into what they do in office. Their character is the problem. How can we expect them to do any better on the national stage than they do in their own marriages? Furthermore, a knowledge of the actual supreme law, not what the courts or anybody else says the supreme law is, but the actual supreme law of our land, the U.S. Constitution, shows that most of the promises being made and most of the programs being touted and being offered are actually, actually unlawful. They're a violation of the supreme law of the land. And so these candidates are promising to violate their oath of office even before they've taken the oath of office. And so the idols, and they are idols, are breathing out threats that they are above the law and somehow they can violate the law. Laws are for little people, not for the great and powerful ones. They have acted above the law and beyond the law already and are promising to do more of the same. And it seems that people are somewhat aware of this, that this is the case with the two big box candidates, and yet at, in spite of this, in spite of the highest unfavorable ratings for both of those candidates, many are still placing their hopes upon them. Furthermore, we know what Washington, D.C. just recently did is even more outrageous demonstration of the idolatry of our federal government. They've reached a new level of idolatry in the treatment of our good friend Chief Justice Roy Moore by suspending him from office this month. You remember 13 years ago, our friend was removed from office. He was removed from office because the issue was, could the state of Alabama acknowledge the one true God, the God of the Bible? And the federal court said, no, the state of Alabama cannot acknowledge God. We will not permit it to acknowledge God, and we will remove you from office because you're insisting on fulfilling your oath to the U.S. Constitution and to the Alabama Constitution that requires you as chief justice to acknowledge God. So the lawbreakers removed the person who was abiding by the law 13 years ago because he said, we must acknowledge God. Today, they removed him because he would not bow down and worship the Supreme Court of the United States as God. That's essentially what they have said. The Supreme Court has changed the laws of the universe and nobody can do anything other than in compliance with the Supreme Court's edict that marriage has been changed. And so they removed him because he would not acknowledge and bow down and worship the Supreme Court of the United States as if it were God. This is the idolatry in our land today. And indeed, he is not alone. I believe anyone else in office across our land, what has happened to him will approach them as well because the idol worshipers cannot tolerate anyone who doesn't worship their idol. And so if anyone stands up and says, no, this is the supreme law of the universe and the federal government is completely out of line, they also will be eventually removed from office as idolatry moves forward. Is there hope for America yet? Can our nation come back from the brink of disaster? Is there a cure for this idolatry that has swept our land? Yes, there is. If you turn in your Bible to Exodus chapter, Exodus chapter 33, there is an answer to turn from and repentance from the idolatry of our day. And a return to worshiping the one true God alone as he truly reveals himself in the word of God. Exodus 33, where we pick up this interchange between Moses and God that we have been studying the past several weeks that Moses is interacting with God. And here in verse 18, Moses says to God, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. He asked 
God to reveal to him his full glory. Show me thy glory. And he said, that is God said back to Moses, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Now we need to remember the context in which Moses was actually asking this question request of God, show me your glory. Moses already had many, many manifestations of God. He had many encounters with God before this request. Let's look at some of the amazing revelations up to this point in the life of Moses. Remember the first one at the burning bush. He was there tending his sheep and saw this bush on fire that was not being consumed and he was amazed. He drew close and God spoke to him out of the burning bush and God called him at that point there at the burning bush to return to the land of Egypt and lead his captive people, the enslaved people of Israel, free from their bondage in Egypt. And then we know that once he was down in Egypt, God revealed himself to him in conversation after conversation after conversation regarding the ten plagues that came upon Egypt at the hand of God. And Moses was to follow specific instructions which, with each of those ten uh, plagues. And then in the Exodus itself, as they left the land of Egypt and as they traveled to Mount Sinai, God again and again had communications with Moses. Moses heard from God. Moses had encounters with God. Turn, if you would, from Exodus 33 back to Exodus 19 because you realize when they reached Mount Sinai, Moses had even more intense encounters with God on Mount Sinai. Look at uh, Exodus chapter 19 and verse 3. Here at Mount Sinai, it says, Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, Thou shalt say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. And from there it continues with a message that God was giving to Moses, that Moses was returned to the people when he came down Mount Sinai. That was the first time he was called up Mount Sinai. Later in that chapter, look at verse 20. He had come down and, and given a message to the people, but at verse 20, and the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord uh, called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And then it goes on to describe what Moses encountered, and Moses came down Mount Sinai this second time, and again, brought a message to the children of Israel. And again, in chapter 20, God calls Moses back up Mount Sinai. If you turn the page to Exodus 20, look at verse 20. Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your face, that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. Again, a third encounter there. Uh, at Mount Sinai with the Lord. And then we know that uh, chapter 20, of course, is the record of the Ten Commandments given to Moses. And then following 20, we have studied in this series many of the commands that God proceeded to give. And turn a few more pages to 24, Exodus 24, where we have a fourth encounter. Exodus 24 and verse 1. And he said unto Moses, God said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. And so this is a different encounter where God says, you're going to bring others with you. The 70 elders of Israel and the, the leadership of the priests are going to come with you partway up Mount Sinai, but only Moses is going to go into the very presence of God there on Mount Sinai. It describes that further on down in that chapter. Look at verse 10 where the, the people gathered with Moses actually see a vision of God. In verse 10 of Exodus 24, And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel he uh, laid not his hand. Also they saw God and did eat and drink. And so these, not just Moses, but the priests, the head of the priests and the head of the elders of Israel, they had a vision of God and they saw God in an amazing sight at a distance. They were not close up. And then we go on down to verse 12 and we see Moses is called again. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, and there I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up, and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into, uh, unto the mount of God. 
And so Moses, again, is going closer to God than all of the rest, a more intimate encounter with God uh, than the rest. Look at verse 16, because Israel, looking at what was taking place on Mount Sinai, was fearful. The glory of the Lord, verse 16, abode upon Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. So Moses went into the most intense place Israel could see and, and fearful the earthquakes and the trembling and the fire on the mount. They were fearful, but Moses went right into the presence of Almighty God. And as we've studied in our time together, chapter 25, 6, 7, 8, 9, and chapter 30 and 31, God gave very specific instructions to Moses, how they were to build the tabernacle, what they were to make the Ark of the Covenant of and the mercy seat, and then the, the objects in the outer court, that is, they were to make the incense altar, and they were to make the... Uh, the uh, the uh, table of the showbread and the golden lampstand. And then in the outer court, uh, the very outer court of the tabernacle, the altar where they were to sacrifice the animals and the laver where they were to cleanse their hands and all the instruments as well as all the details. God gave Moses detailed instructions which we have studied in this interview with God. And the interview ends in chapter 31. Turn to Exodus 31 for a moment. Look at verse 18 that is the end of this 40-day interview with God. Verse 18 of Exodus 31, And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. And as we've studied together, we see that Moses came down from Mount Sinai in chapter 32. And what does he see? He comes down to the valley and he sees the idolatrous people of Israel committing idolatry and immorality, worshiping a golden calf. And in his anger, he throws down the two tables and breaks the two first copies of the Ten Commandments as he came down the mountain and saw the wickedness of the children of Israel. And then God, in his anger, says that he's going to destroy all of Israel. He's going to destroy them all, and Moses is going to be the one that he's going to create a nation out of the, the descendants of Moses alone. And so Moses goes back into God's presence and intercedes for him. Look at chapter 32, Exodus 32, and verse 31. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them a God of gold. Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Moses intercedes for the wicked idolaters and the wicked immoral of his day. And God spares them because Moses interceded in his presence. And then last week we saw how Moses took his tent the tent of meeting, the tent of tabernacle, set it outside the camp so he could meet with God because God said if he came into the midst of the camp of Israel, it would destroy all the people. They would all die. And so Moses set up the tabernacle of meeting and turned to 33, Exodus 33, look at verse 11. The Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he again turned uh, into uh, the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. So when we look at this very, you know, brief history here of covering this, Moses had multiple interactions with God. Mo Moses was in God's presence. Moses saw amazing sights. Moses heard the voice of God. He had tremendous revelations from God, perhaps more than any other human being other than Adam before the fall into sin. As you remember Adam before the fall into sin, God would meet with him daily, walk with him in the cool of the evening. So God had personal, intimate, close fellowship with Adam until Adam and Eve fell into sin. So Moses, perhaps any, other than any other man than Adam, had this kind of intimacy with God. So it's interesting that he makes this request of God, show me your glory. He wants more of God than he's already gotten. He wants to see more. He wants to know more. He wants more intimacy with God than what he has already had. And what he's had is amazing, unbelievable experiences in God's presence. But he wants more. I think an interesting aspect appears here. The more you know God, the more you want to know him. 
The more knowledge you have of Him, the more knowledge you desire to have of Him. A deeper, a fuller, and more intimate relationship is something that you are characterized by the more you know God. This revelation of God, the one true God, is the cure for idolatry in our land. That is, if the people of our land are to turn from the idols they are currently worshiping, they must turn to the one true God and begin serving Him, worshiping Him, and come into relationship with Him through faith in Jesus Christ to reject their idolatry. There is that choice. It's either the one true God or the idols. And that was true for the people of Moses' day when Moses commanded them, we're going to destroy this idol that you've made, this golden calf, crush it to powder, throw it in the water, force you to drink that poisoned water so that you know that it's a worthless idol that you were worshiping. And turn to worship the one true God and to serve Him alone. You know, there's plenty of evidence throughout the history of the church of Jesus Christ that the profound knowledge of God Oh, affects a person so deeply that their life is changed forever. Perhaps you've heard of the 40 martyrs of Sebaste. These were soldiers in the 12th legion of Rome's imperial armor, arm, uh, army. These were the top soldiers, feared the 12th legion of Rome's army. It's about 320 A.D., and one day the captain of their legion came and, and informed the troops that the emperor, Licinius, had sent an edict down to them commanding all soldiers, every single one, to offer a sacrifice to his pagan god. You see, the Roman emperor was a pagan idol worshiper, and he wanted all of his soldiers to be pagan idol worshipers as well. Well, 40 of the soldiers out of that legion were followers of Jesus Christ, and they refused. They said to their commander, you can have our armor, you can even have our bodies, but our hearts' allegiance belongs to Jesus Christ. The emperor decided to make an example of these 40 soldiers. So in the middle of the winter, he marched them onto a frozen lake, stripped them of their clothes, and he said, renounce your God, and you will be spared from death. Not one man of the 40 came forward. And so he left them there huddled together in the middle of the lake to contemplate his offer through the night. And throughout the night, the men stayed together singing their song of victory, 40 martyrs for Christ, 40 martyrs for Christ. When morning came, there were only 39 remaining on the lake. One had broken rank and come and denied Jesus Christ and worshipped the idols that the emperor demanded. But the other 39 were out there in the middle of the lake, nearly dead. The officer in charge that night witnessed all of this, and he was so moved by the faith of the 39 soldiers on that lake that when the one broke rank and came to the shore saving his life, the commander joined the 39 out there on the lake, stripping off his own clothes knowing that he would die like them. The furious emperor demanded that he renounce Jesus Christ, but he refused. And when the oral deal was over, the remaining legion of the Roman soldiers carried 40 frozen men off the ice. You see, these 40 men knew what idol worshiping was about. They had come from an idol worshiping culture, raised as idol worshipers, and they turned to faith in Jesus Christ, and they were not going to turn back to these pagan gods. They knew these pagan gods were worthless. These pagan gods were nothing. They had encountered the one true living God, and they knew they would not turn back, even if it cost them their lives. They would not bow. They would not serve these pagan idols any longer. What if we were put to that test today? And we were told that your life depends upon renouncing Jesus Christ and turning back to the worship of idols. Would we stand the test? Would we be faithful to the end? Here we have the statement of Moses recognizing who God truly is and desiring more of God, that God would reveal Himself more fully to him. And you see, 
When God did ultimately reveal himself to him, it was a greater revelation than Moses had ever experienced. But it's interesting, before Moses is given that revelation, look at what it says here back in, in the Exodus 33. God begins to reveal in what he says about himself something greater than Moses has had revealed to this point. And notice what God says, his essential character. Here's the essential character of God. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. He is Lord of all. He is King of all kings and all kingdoms. He is ruler over all the earth, and He is ruler over all the universe. God is sovereign. And by the way, that's exactly where the modern idolatry of state worship falls flat on its face because it is is not sovereign. Civil government is not sovereign. In fact, it cannot be sovereign. In fact, the government founded in this land by those who were followers of Jesus Christ, it was founded and created in order to protect and secure the God-given rights of the people, of we the people. You see, they understood that the civil government is not sovereign. And instead they understood that we the people are sovereign with a limited sovereignty. God has not given unlimited sovereignty to anyone, but He has given a very limited sovereignty to the people, that the people might secure the God-given rights of themselves and of their family and of their fellow citizens. That's the purpose. So in the full sense of the word, the state does not possess sovereignty at all. The citizens possess limited sovereignty granted to them by God in order that they might be active in defending the God-given rights of the people in the land. Only God is absolutely sovereign. And here our Lord states in Scripture that He is absolutely, totally sovereign. And in His absolute sovereignty, He can do what He chooses to do in the exercise of His mercy. Notice what He says here. He dispenses His mercy to whom He will. He is free, He is completely unconstrained in bestowing His mercy on whom He chooses to bestow it. No sinner can claim that they have a right to God's mercy. No. God is sovereign to choose and do as He pleases. No sinner is entitled to possess God's mercy except God mercifully gives it to him of God's free choice. No man dare to dictate to God what he can do or what he must do. God is sovereign in regards to the objects of his mercy. He's sovereign in regards to the timing of it and the manner of it and the measure of it. And the mercy in his mercy, he gives no account to anyone regarding his sovereign exercise of his powers. God alone is sovereign. And he allows no one to challenge that sovereignty. And this is is directly in conflict with what many people falsely believe today. There are people who believe that human beings are sovereign. They're often of a libertarian persuasion. They reject the sovereignty of God. So, no, I am sovereign. And there's others who believe that civil government is sovereign and we must all bow down and worship and do whatever it demands of us because it is the sovereign. No, there is one sovereign in the universe and that is God Himself, even our Lord Jesus Christ. And we understand who God is and who we are in relationship, then we are in a proper perspective. It has been rightly said that man without God, without a consciousness of, uh, of being sustained and upheld by this omnipotent and eternal being, a man can have no strength or confidence in the present and no hope for the future unless he knows the sovereignty of God. Because man without God is just a feeble part of this vast mechanism of an incomprehensible universe if there is no sovereign God, the God of the Bible. You see, if that were true, if there is no sovereign God, and it's just what we see around us, then Shakespeare's phrase would be true, that life is but a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury signifying nothing. It is meaningless and hopeless and useless. God is going to reveal himself to Moses in a powerful way. Go back to uh, uh, Exodus 33 and look at uh, verses 20 and following because God tells him, Moses, I'm going to reveal to you my glory, but in a limited fashion. You're not going to see the fullness of it. 
Because if you did, you would die, is what he's telling Moses. Look at the verse thir- uh, 20 of Exodus 33. And God said, Thou cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cleft of the rock, the cleft of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take my hand away, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shalt thou not, shalt not be seen. You see, a full revelation of seeing God in his full glory, which is essentially what Moses was requesting, seeing God in his full glory would mean death to that individual, death to, to, to Moses, even though Moses had, had atonement made for his sin, certainly, But nonetheless, Moses was not free from the effects of sin or the taint of sin in this world. And the result of seeing the full face of God, the full glory of God, would mean the absolute destruction of Moses and any other human being as well. Jesus tells us in John 1.18, No man hath seen God at any time. Only the the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. So... In our state, even if we are redeemed, even if the blood of Christ has cleansed us from all sin, we are in no state in our physical present condition to be in God's presence in His full glory. For to be so would be to dis- the complete destruction to our being. And so we have to be transformed. And, and the Scripture tells us we will be transformed. If you have your Bible, turn to 1 John, almost at the end of the New Testament. 1 John chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2 tells what will take place for each of us who has placed our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We one day will be face to face with Christ our Savior. We one day will be so transformed that there is no taint, there is no remnant of sin in us at all, so that we can be face to face with God. But that transformation is not possible in this life and in this body. Indeed, it requires either Christ's return, and if Christ returns before we die, Scripture tells us that we will be raptured, that is, we will be caught up in the air, and we will be transformed, that is, this mortal body will become the immortal resurrection body in a twinkling of the eye. And if that is our condition, then we will be transformed as we rise. If we are, have died in Christ before that point, then our immortal spirit, which at death goes into the presence of God the Father, that immortal spirit will come and inhabit a body out of the grave that is resurrected in a pure, righteous, uh, uh, perfect body that then can be in God's presence. In our current state, it is impossible for us to see God face to face. And it was impossible for Moses as well to see God face to face, even though he was probably the most righteous man of his Uh, generation. We have this precious promise that one day we shall be transformed and be, as it says here, we will be like him for we shall see him face to face. We will face God in eternity. When we look at what Moses represents to us, we see that he sets an example that ought to be in our hearts as well. Desiring to know God more deeply and fully than we do at this point in our lives. And the thing that we see in Moses, the more you get to know God, the more you desire to know Him. The more you know about Him, the more you want to know about Him. It is a growing uh, uh, depth of uh, uh, closeness with Him. If you have your Bible, turn to Psalm 42 because I think the psalmist gives us a good picture of what that closeness with God is actually looks like and the psalmist expresses it in this beautiful uh, poetic picture here of the deer who is very thirsty in the forest psalm 42 and verse 1 as the deer panteth after the water brooks 
So panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? You see, this idea that if we really know God, we have an insatiable thirst to know Him more. To know Him more through His Word. And so a sign that we truly have living faith in Jesus Christ is that we desire to know God more. And therefore we spend time in His Word. We desire to know God more intimately. Therefore we spend time in prayer with Him. We desire to worship Him, and so we gather together with His saints to worship Him on a regular basis. We enjoy getting to know God through our fellow believers, and so we long for that fellowship with our fellow believers because Jesus said, inasmuch as you did it unto the one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. And so the Word of God and prayer and worship and fellowship, those are four signs that if we really have Christ in us, we'll be growing in our longing for those four things in our life. Pastor Mitchell writes a little uh, commentary on this, and he observed the fact that uh, many people say, well, they didn't feel fed, you know, when they go to church. And he says, I assume they didn't learn anything useful, or they didn't feel the presence of God when they came to worship. Also heard the charge that, "Ah, I don't like doing things this way, or that version of this, or that, and And he said that he compared this to his kids coming, complaining that there's nothing to eat in the house. Have any of you parents heard that at any time? Nothing to eat in the house. And when he says, then I point out the various options and they exclaim, I don't like that. My response is always the same. Then you aren't truly hungry yet. (laughs) What does it say about us if God spreads a table for us? And we say, well, I prefer not that or that. We aren't truly hungry yet. You see, in a time of famine, people will eat whatever is available, whatever is edible. It won't matter what it tastes like. It's a matter of food that they are uh, hungry for. They'll accept whatever condition. And likewise with us as followers of Jesus Christ, if we are truly hungry, we will be glad for anything that the Lord puts on the table uh, before us. We will leave filled and contented. Solomon, in God's wisdom that he gave him, in Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 11 said, He, God, hath made everything beautiful in his time. He also hath set eternity in their hearts so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. You see, we were made not for this world. We were made for eternity. We were made for eternal fellowship with God forever and ever. That's what we were designed for, which is why Everything that we think will satisfy us in this world ultimately says, oh, that's only maybe partially sad, you know, and we want more and more. If we turn to God, we discovered that's where our true satisfaction comes from. What we value will be revealed by what we are willing to pay for it, the sacrifice we are willing to make for it. There was a tourist some years ago that was admiring a necklace around uh, an Indian's neck and uh, commented and asked, well, what is it made of? Alligator teeth came the response. And she kind of condescendingly replied, well, I suppose that they mean as much to you as our pearls do to us. And the Indian responded, oh, no, oh, no. Anybody can open an oyster. (laughs) You see, what we value is revealed by what we're willing to pay for it. And for followers of Jesus Christ, if it costs us nothing, then it's not very valuable to us, is it? The sign of faith is what we value. Do we have a hunger for God, a desire to hear from Him each day by spending time in His Word, by spending time in prayer? Do we hunger for the worship of God such that that is a priority in our week? Do we long for the fellowship of the saints, the followers of Jesus Christ? It reveals what our values are. You know, the Bible is everywhere, easily accessible today for anyone in the world. John Ortberg writes, it's a strange thing because this book, the Bible, has never been more accessible than it is now. And he goes on to talk about different books that have been translated into language, but the Bible outstrips any other book in terms of languages that it's been translated into. This is a few years back, but it was at that point 2,656 languages. No book even comes close to that in terms of 
translations around the world. And you look at our own country. Every year, more than 65 million copies of the Bible are bought and, and taken home or distributed in the U.S. alone. No book even comes close to that number. And so the average household in our land has at least three Bibles in it. And people cheer the Bible. They buy the Bible. They give the Bible as gifts. They own the Bible. They just actually, he says, don't read the Bible. It's there on the shelf. It's easily accessible, but it's not a priority in their week. According to George Gallup, one-third of those surveyed in America couldn't tell you who delivered the Sermon on the Mount. They had no idea. Eighty percent of born-again people who identify as born-again Christians believe that the Bible contains the verse, God helps those who help themselves. No, it doesn't. Nowhere. That was Benjamin Franklin. It wasn't, it wasn't the Bible at, at all that came up with that. And so when we think about whether we have the real disease, that is, we have true faith in Jesus Christ, it's easy to see. What are our priorities? What do we value? The question we ought to ask ourselves if we don't have that hunger, that thirst for God, for His Word, for prayer, for worship, for fellowship, are we really in Christ? And you might think, well, that's not a really good question to ask, but Apostle Paul asked that question at the end of 2 Corinthians. Let me read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Paul says, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves? How that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? So he's challenging those who claim to be Christians in the church of Corinth. Examine yourself. See if you have the real disease. Do you have a hunger and thirst for God that compares to nothing else in your life? Are those signs missing in your life that would indicate that you truly have been brought to faith in Jesus Christ? And would you be willing to suffer for Christ no matter what the cost? I read recently of a, a bit of an autobiography of a, a Jan Balik who was used of God in Yugoslavia prior to the breaking up of that country and the end of, of communism there in that part of Europe. And he said he was scheduled to perform a wedding ceremony in the town of Jasnik. And he said, I preached a message about marriage, and then the young couple came to stand in front of me to take their marriage vows according to the Word of God. Suddenly the door of the church burst open, and a policeman with a rifle marched in, shoved the barrel of that rifle into my chest, and yelled, hands up. Everyone present looked in fear, wondering what was go going on. It reminded me so much of what happened when they came to arrest Jesus. And he said, be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves, Luke 22. Then the policeman, he said, took me, took me to Lakova and handed me over to a member of the interior ministry. And that member began to angrily interrogate me. What are you doing in Janicek? I replied, I was invited to perform a wedding here. Then he yelled, I will teach you a lesson. You will no longer wander around here and there and talk to people about some God that doesn't exist. Immediately he began to slap me in the face while beating me. He said, does God exist? I replied, yes, and he created all things. And he beat me even more furiously and yelled some more. Then why, didn't, why did God allow World War II? I answered as best I could in the middle of the blows. It wasn't God's doing. It's people and their hate and the evil of sin in their hearts that causes devastating wars. Then he again asked, does God exist? Again I replied, yes, he exists. And he became even angry and began to beat me in, uh, with his fist while calling me all sorts of names and blaspheming God. Then the third time he asked, does God exist and where is he? And I replied as always, yes, God exists and he is eternal and he is sitting on the throne of his glory in heaven. One day of his terrible judgment, we will all stand before him and receive what we deserve, a reward or punishment according to what everyone has done in his earthly life. When I confirmed my faith in God and his existence the third time, he became furious and could not, that he could not force me to deny God. And he snatched up his revolver and began to beat me with it, raining blows all over my body. He thought with this outburst, he would scare me into submission. In his furious anger, he hollered, Where is God when the fascists were murdering our women and children? How could he have watched over this awful injustice? As he was ranting and raving, I suddenly felt sorry for him. I pitied him because he was under the influence of the devil, 
not knowing what he was blaspheming, the God who is the God of love. I was getting ready to reach out to him, and at that moment he hit a very sensitive spot on my chest near the heart, and I began to lose consciousness. Only then did he stop beating me for fear of killing me because uh, President Tito had just passed a law that killing was no longer allowed until there had at least been a fair trial. They called for the policeman over to haul me to jail. Then they brought in my friend Michael, and they began interrogating him and beating him in another room. And uh, that night, they led us out of the prison. The man that beat me came to me and said, you will not do this anymore. And I replied, you need to teach people to tolerate each other in love so that people live in peace with one another. We certainly do that because we know that our God is a God of love and he wants to save everyone who believes in him and repents of his sin. Then he dismissed us, get on the train, go home, do not come back to Genesis. As we traveled home on that train, we praised the Lord for giving us patience and for counting us worthy to suffer for him just as his apostles had. We don't know what lies ahead for us as followers of Jesus Christ here in this land, but persecution could be part of that. And we need to determine in our minds, will we stand for Christ no matter what? We need to be certain that we are truly in the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if we are, the signs will be apparent. We will have a hunger and a thirst for God, a thirst for His Word, a thirst for prayer, time in His presence every day. We will desire to be together with his saints and worshiping God. And we will love the fellowship of the saints. These are the things that are signs in us that we truly have faith in Jesus Christ. And we live in a day where we are going to be tested. That I think we can be sure of. We need to be certain of our faith and be prepared to fight.